And joining us now on the debate for the full hour tonight, in Boston, Massachusetts, Perry Merling, professor of economics at Barnard College and advisor at the Institute for New Economic Thinking. In our nation's capital, Don Drummond, former chief economist with the TD Bank and the Matthews Fellow in Global Public Policy at Queen's University. In London, Ontario, David Laidler, Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Western Ontario and Fellow in Residence with the C.D. Howe Institute. And with us here in studio, Thurston Köppel, Professor and RBC Fellow in the Department of Economics at Queen's University. And it's a pleasure to have uh, two returning guests to our program. David and Don, nice to see you again, and two new guests on the program as well. We thank you for joining us for what will be a bit of Macroeconomics 101 tonight. And David, why don't you get us started as we explore this. Since the financial crisis of 2008, economics has, of course, to a significant degree, been under attack. What part of economics in particular do you think has been under attack? Well, it's just the macroeconomics part. There's a whole lot of economics that has to do with trade theory and labor markets and things that's completely untouched. It's the part of economics that deals with the business cycle, the workings of the financial system, inflation, unemployment, and things like that. Perry, would you agree it's the macroeconomics part of the equation that has really been under a fire? Yes, I, I would, um, although I would add that I, I think finance, uh, efficient market theory and whatnot, uh, has, has also taken some drubbing. We're going to go through all of these terms tonight during the course of our program. Don, when the recession, when the recession rather hit in the United States, uh, Keynesianism, of course, Keynesianism found new life, primed the pump, increased public spending, cushioned people from the uh, ravages of the recession. Where does that approach fit into macroeconomics? Well, certainly, as you say, with Keynes, and that's going back an awful long time, uh, some 70 years, this theory uh, largely brought to life during the period of the Great Depression when the economies are down on the knees and the private sector doesn't want to spend. There's an obligation for the public authorities to come in and spend their brains out, save taxes. The problem was when this got uh, brought back out of the archives in 2008, they forgot the first part is that before you launch into spending your brains out, you're supposed to have been in a position of roughly fiscal balance. I mean, Keynes never said go into huge de de deficits and debt all the time. You're supposed to roughly balance it over the cycle, which gives you the latitude and the ability to prime the pump, as you said, when you do get in trouble. The problem was the Greeces and the Italys and the Irelands and the United States is were all in huge deficit and debt, and then they just piled more on it. That, that's not the following of the economic theory. We can't hang that one in economic theory. Now, that is, we should make that distinction, I guess, Thor, because, uh, you know, certainly the conventional wisdom is Keynes said spend your brains out when times get tough, but the other half of it is we are supposed to sort of run balanced books the rest of the time, are we not? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, uh, just, just look at Europe right now. I think that's, that's the, the key example. If you look at the European situation, uh, you had already an uh, inflated uh, debt-to-GDP ratio, and now the crisis hit, and they went to Economics 101. They said, like, the obvious thing to do is, like, we do more stimulus spending, and that just pushed them over the edge, it seems. Certainly the case in Greece, and here we are. And so uh, if I just expand on this a little bit and pick up on, on, on David's comments, yeah, maybe macro is a little bit in crisis, but you have to be careful because we know a, a lot in macroeconomics. We have learned a lot over the last 30 years, and this has to be balanced against what we're seeing right now. Hmm. David, did, we, did our governments around the world forget about the other part of the Keynesian equation, which is try to balance the books the rest of the time? Well, they sure did. We didn't in Canada, but then, of course, we almost hit the wall in 1995. In hindsight, we were really lucky. Uh, but other countries, yeah, they just let it go, and they lost the lost sight of the first principle of careful economic policy making, which is always make sure you're in a position to deal with a crisis if it turns up, because it's always going to turn up unexpectedly. Hmm. Perry, let's check now on another, I guess, one of the uh, darlings of the uh, right wing in your country in the 20th century, an economist by the name of Milton Friedman, uh, whom Ronald Reagan quite liked. Uh, quite the opposite of John Maynard Keynes, of course. How did Friedman shape the study of economics when he was alive? Oh, well, he was tremendously influential, um, not at first, um, but over, over time, um, as a critic of the Keynesian orthodoxy of, of, his, of his time. Um, in, 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 in many dimensions, um, but it, it's important for your listeners to appreciate the debate between the Keynesians and the monetarists, as it was called, um, say in the 1960s, 
uh, is, what, is what gave rise to the next macroeconomics. It's not so much that debate between the Keynesians and monetarists that is at stake now. It's, it's what came after. Okay, just follow up on that. What do you mean? Um, well, what came after that in, in uh, the 1970s or so is the rational expectations revolution, as it's called, and new classical economics. Um, there's always a debate in economics between people who think the economy uh, doesn't need much help and, and is, is, is stable on its own without much government interference. Um, let's call those monetarists. Um, and people who think it does need some uh, careful attention, those tend to call themselves Keynesians. But they don't necessarily have much to do with Friedman or, or, or Keynes. Um, this same debate goes on today and uh, under, di under different labels. Well, I don't mean to set up a false debate here, but Don, maybe you could come in and, and help, us, help us understand where the theories of Milton Friedman are today. Certainly when Ronald Reagan was president, he was the rage. What do economists essentially think of where Friedman's theories would have put us today? Well, I think there's one key aspect of uh, what he was talking about that virtually everybody bought onto, and that was the importance of keeping inflation at a low level. And I would say going into 2007, a feeling of complacency had settled around in most countries that if you kept inflation low, and it was pretty much under control everywhere, that everything would be okay. Yes, you might have still some cycles, but they'd be relatively mild. So one lesson that surely has to have been registered from this experience is that that doesn't guarantee they're going to have a steadily growing economy. I'm not ready to say it's not still a necessary condition, but we certainly learned that maintaining inflation out of control is not sufficient. And even in that monetary world, there's a lot of other things you have to worry about. So my argument would be the Federal Reserve Board, who has many of the supervisory responsibilities that in Canada would be elsewhere, such as the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, completely went to sleep on their other responsibilities. And yes, they did their one job of keeping inflation. But, for example, it was their responsibility to look at what was happening in subprime mortgages, and they completely went out of touch on that. So it's a, it's a more stringent test, I think, if you want to apply sensible monetary policy and, and be able to be, be somewhat confident the economy is going to perform well. Thor, do we have Milton Friedman to thank for the fact that inflation is something that uh, we have really committed to whipping over the last, say, 20, 25 years? I think so. To a large degree. I mean, if you look at the influence of Milton Friedman, I mean, it, it goes beyond his own work. I mean, uh, I think Perry brought up rational expectations. I think that grows out of his, his, his work, out of his teaching. Uh, he taught the people that, that, that started with the rational expectations revolution. And I think all these concepts are still very, very useful because one cannot forget that rational expectations must be seen, for example, as a particular tool to do research. It's not really that we all believe that people are always rational. Rational expectations are there to basically check the consistency of your model, because people are not robots. And it makes exactly the opposite assumption. People are pretty smart, eventually, in figuring things out. They will react to policy. And I think that comes out of the thinking of Milton Friedman, the teaching of Milton Friedman, and other people like Bob Lucas and so forth have put that to work and have put it to good work, I think. And we can't forget that. David, I always got the impression, though, that Friedman thought taxes were, uh, let's put it uh, charitably, a, ne a necessary evil, but still evil. Is look, that fair to I say? Was, look, I was Friedman's student and his research assistant on his work on the Great Depression. Hmm. And the big lesson that came out of that work was that you needed really active monetary policy on the quantitative easing style once you got into trouble. Uh, as I say, he taught me, he taught Bob Lucas as well. He did not teach Thomas Sargent, he did not te teach Ed Prescott. Much of this rational expectations work came out of mathematical economics being taught at other schools. So I would not want to hang what's going on now around Milton's neck. How about the issue of taxes, though? Did he think taxes were evil? Uh, he thought taxes were a necessary evil. He was a man who believed in small government, but he wasn't a supply-sider. He wasn't one of these pop economists who thought that if you cut taxes, you could eliminate deficits by generating growth. He was much more sensible and balanced than that. Perry, we've heard this expression a couple of times already. Maybe we should get into some detail about that. Rational choice theory. What is that a reference to? 
Well, rational choice theory, um, it, it, it has, uh, to economists, it has a lot of resonances, but the, the main idea is thinking of individuals, both consumers and businesses, as uh, having, having in mind solving some optimizing problem um, using the information at their, at, at their uh, disposal um, and thinking ahead and imagining what the future is going to be like and, and, and making their consumption decisions, making their investment decisions in that kind of rational optimizing way as opposed to creatures of habit, say, or just using your gut or, 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 or whatever. But Don, is the assumption that we are all, in all of our consumer purchases, in all of our lending, in all of our borrowing, we're going to be rational in the way we do it? No, absolutely not. And, and of course, time preferences come into mind, too. How forward-looking are we? Uh, you could just go and spend an extraordinary amount of money in the short term and maybe get by, but there are really people thinking in five or ten years the difficulty that's going to be. Do countries think that way? I mean, again, the United States is not in the type of crises at the moment that some of the European economies are, but surely if they looked a little bit further than that, a rational belief would be they are, but that's not reflected in the public discourse, never mind the public policy. So uh, it's, a, it's a nice theory, but uh, you know, it's a little bit difficult sometimes to apply it to real life. Thor, what do you say on it? Well, 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 I'm a little bit torn here, I have to say, mm -hmm. because I mean, Rational choice theory or people optimizing in models has a certain, plays a certain role, plays a certain function. Of course, no one believes, I guess, that we are always rational, always making rational choice. But it plays the function that we can check our models for internal consistency, and that's worth a lot. However, I'm not saying we should stop there. I'm all for it, introducing new features into these models that push us more towards a better micro-foundation for these models, that we can assess better how forward-looking people are and so forth. There are, is certain research on the way. The problem here is certainly uh, it had some success, the other theory. It doesn't mean we have to dump it, go three steps back. We have to move forward. We have to integrate new approaches into this theory. We have to work on it, make it better, and this is how we're going to progress. So the bottom line but, here is really we have to look forward. We have to, we have to search for a new micro foundation and then see where we are going. We can't just say, okay, this is just ad hoc assumptions and we see what we're going to get. We need to find a solid, consistent a consensus on a new micro foundation. We're working on that. We're not quite there. David, come on in. Yeah, I don't think rationality is really the point. I think the point is the way in which society does not or does not coordinate the choices of individuals, no matter how they're made. Let me give you a simple example. Uh, I just had a cup of coffee with some milk in it, right? Uh, the coffee beans came from somewhere in South America, somewhere in Africa, I don't know. Uh, the milk was there. It came from a cow. I haven't seen a cow for years, right? <laughs> there are a whole lot of decisions and coordination issues that have to be solved to get anybody's choices, rational or otherwise, solved. And I believe that modern macroeconomics has lost sight of the importance of those coordination mechanisms, the way financial markets function to keep people together with their savings and their investments, the way in which money flows across counters in countless stores and into pay packets in order to get people doing the right thing and providing, you know, the cup of coffee when I want it. We've lost sight of that in macroeconomics, and that's very, very sad. That, by the way, is what Keynes put front and center. Perry, you want a word on that? Well, yeah, let me, let me agree with that and chime in and go, and go farther. I would say the, the, what Keynes brought to our attention is a, is a question. Is rational choice possible? given the kind of world that we, that we have, um, and in particular about time in the future, given that we really have very, very little sense of what the future holds, um, how can we make optimizing intertemporal, intertemporal choices? Um, it's not clear that rationality does us much good. Um, and uh, that's another way of saying that a lot of this coordination problem is, that, that David rightly mentions, okay, is coordination over time. Um, and uh, so it's, it's not an easy problem, um, and the models make it look easy because they, the, the, the mathematics are, are easier if you, if you just make assumptions about what the future is going to look like. In the real world, that's, that's dangerous to do. Hmm. Don? Steve, can I go back to uh, David Laidler's part? Because I think he brought us right to the heart of the rudest awakening for macroeconomists in 2007. So in David's example with the coffee, he was going through the physical trade links, but what we really were surprised was, was the complexity of the financial links. 
So let's just take Lehman Brothers. By the scheme of things, and if you compare it to the TD Bank, it was a pretty small company. It had very little capital relative to the TD Bank and the other Canadian banks. But the shocker when it went down was its uh, interdependency of so many financial institutions around the world. Uh, even more shocking is when we got into the threat that maybe the giant uh, insurance company, AIG, would go down. And you realize they had their fingers on virtually every financial transaction that was going around in every corner of the world. I'm not sure the macroeconomics theory had fully come to reckon with that, but I can tell you for certain macroeconomic models had not factored in that whatsoever. And those interdependencies were what created that grave danger and why something in some remote corner of the world that seemingly had very little to do with other parts of the world felt the shock almost simultaneously. You know, we had the, every stock market in the world peaked virtually the same day. Everyone virtually troughed at the same day. And it's, it's created a, a synchronization of economic activity around mm -hmm. the world, too, that didn't exist before. We used to have one area would be up and one area would be down. But these interconnections have changed that nation of the business cycle around the world dramatically. So Thor, let's see if we can get our head around what kind of a consensus we seem to be coming to here. Rational choice theory, which was a, a wonderful economic theory people liked for a long time, seems to be leaving people rather cold. The events of the past few years seem to have economists looking for something else. Do you know what the something else is? No, I, I, I really... Personally, I don't know it. If I knew it, I would write mm -hmm. papers on end right now and they would be published immediately. But I like how the whole discussion evolved here because we have gotten away from really attacking rationality because everybody here in this round, in, the, in this discussion, realizes it served a purpose. I like what the other people said in terms of like the financial system. Uh, when I was in grad school, people told me business leads and finance follows. Don't do research about financial economics. That's not true anymore. I like also what, uh, what the coordination problems uh, the, the emphasis on the coordination problem, as David said, or Perry said, I think, but, but we're starting to work on that, and that's actually positive signs. If you think about decision-making on uncertainty, we always said, like, yeah, we kind of can assess what the probabilities for future events are, but we have moved away from that. There are new uh, theories coming out that try to look at uncertainty. How do people make decisions under uncertainty, under real uncertainty, under what we call Knightian uncertainty, where, we, where you can't figure out what's going on? And I think also the crisis teaches us, uh, basically, that's a key factor right now, that we cannot move forward because there's so much uncertainty generated by politicians, by everything, by the interlinkages in the, in, the, in the financial system, in the whole global economy. And I think these channels, what David talked about, coordination, we have to investigate these further. But it seems to me there's work underway, good work underway. That's, that's the wipe that I'm getting. Hmm. David, what do you think the past few years have taught us about the applicability of any of these economic theories that uh, we've all been so interested in. Yeah, I, w I would like to say two things. First of all, I think it's wrong to distinguish between trade links and financial links. Everybody who brings me a cup of coffee has got dealings with a bank and a line of credit, and if a gang bank goes broke, the line of credit disappears, that bit of the chain breaks down. The financial system and the real economy are completely interdependent. The second thing that you said is Keynes talked about overcoming the dark forces of time and ignorance. Now, modern mm -hmm. macroeconomics thought that the rational expectations theory was a way of cutting straight through that and enabling people to forget about it. And a whole generation of economists forgot about that. We're now talking about doing new economics. And my particular gripe in this business is if you would go back to the 1920s and 30s, you would find that an awful lot of this work had already been done, not to current mathematical levels, but with an awful lot of insight and imagination by some very smart people that were taken off the reading lists in the 1970s and 80s, prematurely in my view. Don, do you want to quibble at all with the um, suggestion that uh, David just made that trade and finance need to be inextricably linked? No, I absolutely agree with them. That I, I think the take of where we've arrived so far as macroeconomic theorists have some further work to go. I think that the realities of the world and these trade and the financial linkages have become more complex than their theory had embraced. We know that the macroeconomic models, which are of critical importance because that's what we use to do economic forecasts, that's what we do to estimate the impacts of public policy, are completely out to lunch, completely almost irrelevant relative to the complexity of the world. But you know what? If you could rewind 
rewind the world to about 1995, and if you could have made me dictator for 10 or 15 years, I don't think we would have got into this mess. Even if the knowledge of macroeconomics had not been better, and even if the models hadn't been better, despite all of those flaws, I think really silly mistakes were made that did not get predicted and did not get foisted upon anybody. If countries back in the 1995s had done what Canada and a few others did and got themselves back and stayed in fiscal balance, and a monetary authorities who had a regulatory responsibility on top of looking after the money supply had done some sensible policies and not got into all these lousy mortgages and subprime automobile loans and all the rest of it, I don't think we would have been in this mess. And maybe it would have been better if we'd had better theories and better models, but I don't think we can hang it on that. I just think a lot of mistakes were made given that imperfect sense of knowledge. Perry, I do want to take a step back for a second here and go back once again to our kind of Macroeconomics 101, we've heard a lot of discussion now about economic models and modeling. And just to make sure everybody understands what that is, how'd you like to help us on that? Uh, economic models and modeling. Um, well, the, the model that everyone has been sort of dancing around referring to here, um, that, is, that is at the moment the central model in macroeconomics is something called the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model um, in which individuals are rational, forward-looking, and, and you're looking for an equilibrium of that system, and you're imagining in the mathematical structure of that that uh, this system is getting hit with various exogenous shocks, and people are responding optimally to that, and the government is trying to help them um, by having some kind of optimal policy. That's the world of the math. Okay, but it's not the world that we live in. I want to. I want to just be. I know you seem to have me pegged here as the person who gives the economics 101, which is <laughs> fine. That's what I do for a living. Um, but but I do want to take off a little bit from where Don was 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 leaving us. I think we we need to appreciate the financial the, the the major fact of our world in the last 30 years is financial globalization, which has. Um, reduced the power of the nation state to run its own affairs. Um, and the kinds of ways even that Keynes was thinking about the world are outdated for the modern world in, 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 taking, in grabbing a hold of that. The DSGE model doesn't even have banks in it in, the, in, it, in, its, standard, in its standard form. This is a model mm. that's not connected to the most important fact of our, of our modern world. But if our modern financial world and economic world, Thor, is meant to be as a result of the modeling that you economists do, it obviously matters what you put in, right? What do you put into these models so that you get out what you want to get out? It does. And I, I, I don't like right now the turn this whole discussion takes, I have to say. OK. <laughs> What's your problem? If I, if I go back to David and to Perry, I, I think we have to stay honest why we are modeling. I think a model, I, I, if you would, basically modeling in three steps. The first step is really you draw up a model to check some intuition about something that you try to explain. And the model just ensures the, 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 the logical consistency here. Mm -hmm. In macroeconomics, there's then a second step. You're going to take this model and try to, to make it work with data in terms of in a quantitative assessment of this model. And the model, you see how well the model does. Now, how do you do this? You have to use historical data. That's clear, right? Because how, we can't but, do experiments. But how useful is historical data when you have unprecedented but things happening? But that's what I'm saying is mm -hmm. if, it, if it works well, we use it for prediction. But there's, of course, the problem. You can use statistical methods to, to try to predict something, but it's a little bit like baseball. You have lots of statistics, but you know, at the end of the day, it's highly unpredictable what's going to happen in the next inning. So, so As in we response, found out last night. Exactly. <laughs> so, but in response to David now, to come back to this, this whole discussion, I think... It's wrong to just go back and say, like, oh, we knew this in the 20s and the 30s. So let's get rid of what we learned in macroeconomics. This is still useful, what we learned. We should build on this foundation and move forward. Also, what Perry said, the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, yes, most of them don't have banks in it. Maybe we should throw banks in it. If you think they're important, yes. Let's, let's see how this model does. This is progress, right? And with David, I mean, we incorporating this, this, these, these, these things right now. If you go to seminars, if you go to workshops, I mean, we go back to getting these ideas back in our models and try to incorporate them. So going back to these, uh, to these ideas does not preclude us from building mathematical models, and we should do that. That's the only way we can progress, I think. David, uh, Thor just referenced baseball, and I want to pick up on a baseball analogy if I can with you. In baseball, if you get up to the plate uh, 10 times and you manage to get three hits, 
you're a pretty good baseball player and they'll pay you, you know, anywhere from five to 10 to 15 million bucks a year for doing that. Uh, if you're an economist batting 300, is that any good? Yeah, I mean, I want to get back to this modeling business with Thor, if you don't mind. <laughs> I, I repeat, I too am Milton Friedman's student. I too have a PhD from the University of Chicago. Bob Lucas was my uh, classmate. I am not against building economic models. My particular gripe about the current generation of economic models has been for the last 20 years that they've ignored coordination issues. They have simplified greatly, which you always have to do with models, but we have known for a long time that the results those simplified assumptions yield do not generalize to more complicated mathematical structures. And a large part of the profession has not been interested in discussing these issues. I do not want to replace the economic theory reading list with John Maynard Keynes and Friedrich von Hayek, but I do want people who are taking modern economic theory at least to have read some of their works. And we have been, gener been graduating a whole generation of PhDs in economics who have not read Keynes, they've not read Hayek. Nowadays, they've barely read Milton Friedman. They've probably got Paul Samuelson dropping off the reading list. There has been too much stress on the progress that's been made in the last 10 years and not enough skepticism about whether it's really as progressive as people say it is. Okay, Don, it's not just because I was up till 1.30 in the morning watching that Game 6 of the World Series last night that I want to continue this baseball <laughs> analogy. Uh, the, the, I actually do want your opinion on the numbers here. You're a great hitter in the majors if you can bat 300. If you're an economist and you get it right three times out of ten, is that considered any good? That would be fantastic because it is very much like baseball. <laughs> the timing has to be perfect and the direction has to be perfect. Uh, I'll give you a case. Is it possible to create sympathy for economists? Let me plead my case to you. <laughs> so despite using macroeconomic models that didn't pick up these linkages that David is picking, I was convinced that U.S. housing market was going to tank in 2005. Again, not because the models took it. They were so imperfect, they did not pick up the imbalances that were being created in household balance sheets. But just in my view, common sense determined that. I underestimated act activity in U.S. housing and in the U.S. economy. Every single quarterly forecast, 2005, 2006, and mid-2007, I have slight characteristics of the rest of the human race after being wrong for that long. Of course, I chickened out on it, and of course, you know what happened. No sooner did I chicken out that the whole thing fell. So it would be a little bit like a baseball player. I would have had a great swing, but it wouldn't have <laughs> quite got to the, over the plate when the ball was going over the plate. It might have been in the catcher's glove at that time. So it is pretty darn difficult. So I would say, yeah, if you could get somewhere in that 300 batting average as an economist, you'd do being pretty well. And of course, the reality is virtually nobody got it even in the right direction. So the, I mean, the ball was going direct back for a foul ball, not going going the proper direction. I'd put it the other way, Don. I'd say you were ahead of the pitch, and therefore or you, you pulled it foul off to your to your power alley. So <laughs> one, that, one that's way or not another, bad. it didn't go where it's supposed to no, go. No, you're a little ahead of the curve. That's all. Well, Perry, let me follow up with this. Did the economic models that we were using prior to the Great Recession and the financial meltdown of 2008 take into account the influence of the financial sector to the economy? Insufficiently, um, and uh, I'll I'll say I'll say even more about that. Um, this, I was thinking as, as others were speaking about this 300 hitter uh, analogy, economics is a lot harder than baseball. Okay, I'll Perry, say Perry, okay. nothing <laughs> is harder in the world than to hit a ball that's coming at your head at 90 miles an well, hour that, while 50,000 fans are screaming. I'm sorry, I disagree. <laughs> that, that, uh, that, that's not the sense in which I meant it. I, I meant that, uh, that the, the, the game of baseball is based on the laws of physics. Okay, <laughs> which don't change all the time. Um, and whereas economics is a system that is evolving and moving, it's a social science, and the, and it's not it's not behaving the same all the time. This is a historical system. So I would put in a plug uh, for th for 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 learning some history and having some. Uh, therefore, some humility about our ability to actually see into the future. If the future is going to be different from the past. That we know. We don't know much more than that. Okay, fair point. But uh, Thor, let me follow up with this. Uh, the public, at least before 2008, the public really came to trust economists to kind of get it right. And many economists spectacularly got it wrong in 2008. Um, I don't want that necessarily to prejudice a hundred years of looking at economic theory. Are you guys still, if you take a century or more into account, more often right than wrong? 
That's a very tough question. I never looked at that really like this. I, I, I think if I, if I look at this whole scenario in terms of making prediction or advising uh, decision makers like politicians and so forth or like uh, institutions like the Bank of Canada and so forth, I think it's more about well, what's the job of an economist. Well, there is some forecasting involved, some, some predicting the future involved. But it's also more advising of, of basically pre presenting a particular picture in its entirety. So basically, the job is also to saying, like, look, you have these effects and these effects and these effects. And so uh, I think the fault for the economist in the, over the last 10 years was that we basically were m maybe a little bit blindfolded and not uh, doing our job. Who put not the by, blindfold on? Well, that's a, that's a big question. Maybe, maybe ourselves. We, we grew a little bit complacent because things turned out well. They worked well. I mean, we thought like we had conquered the business cycle again, like we, we thought in the 70s. And we fell flat on our face a Inflation little bit. was low, yeah, everybody's exactly, making money, exactly, interest rates low. Everything is perfect, yeah. so to speak. And so we didn't do our job. But it was not our job really to predict maybe the crisis or something, because that's hard to do anyway, because every crisis is going to be different. But it's more like presenting what could go wrong, putting mm -hmm. out scenarios, and, and basically going this extra step of saying, that's not the obvious. Let's go beyond the obvious or the, what is right there sitting on the plate. Basically me, expanding the discussion. I think that's the economist's job. If me, I advise somebody, that's what I want to do. Let me follow up with David on that. The, the, the suggestion that the job of an economist is not to raise warning signals that your housing market is overextended, these subprime mortgages are you know, a, a disaster waiting to happen. Is that the job of the economist as it relates to, to advising politicians? Look, the economist is more than one type of person. Some people do that sort of thing. Some people try to build models. We are not a homogeneous group. There were people recognized as economists who warned that troubles were coming out of those imbalances. For example, the research staff of the Bank for International Settlements were going from conference to conference uh, seven or eight years ago warning people, and no one was listening. Uh, we're not fortune tellers. We're not forecasters. But it is our job, I think, or our responsibility, if we think we have some insights from what we teach in the classroom that might help policymakers, to bring those things to the attention of policymakers. Whether they then take notice of it or not is up to the policymakers. And in you know, the flattest way, the whole economics profession was worried about rising deficits before we got into this depression. It was that the policymakers were ignoring economists on that issue. It was too politically difficult to face it. Well, let me follow up with Don on this then. The, uh, you were, of course, associated with one of the best uh, budget balancing exercises probably in the Western world when you and Paul Martin and David Dodge got the books of this country back into balance back in the mid-90s. Is it reasonable for politicians to put their faith as policymakers uh, into economists, given all of what we've talked about so far on the program? I still think so, because I, I think the Economists aren't completely dependent upon their models. So in defense of what happened in the 2000s, as, as I indicated, as back as far as 2005, I did forecast and steadily forecasted a weakening in the economy. I didn't get the depth of it nearly right, but I did get the direction of it right. We were screaming bloody murder over the subprime elements of it. And you'll notice that uh, TD Bank was one of the few institutions around the world that didn't have one cent of subprime mortgages. I think we were the only institution in Canada that did not have non-bank asset-backed commercial paper. So somebody saw that. Some institutions and the people in them did see the dangers, and they did act upon them in, in a fortuitous way for their clients and, and their employees, I might, I might add. Not really explicitly because they're models, because again, the models didn't link, give those linkages. So going back into the mid-1990s, the models actually we were working with the Department of Finance actually showed the opposite. They basically said the more you spend and the further you go back in the deficit, the better the economy will be. At some point, that might have created inflation, and that would have led to an increase in interest rates, and the party would have been over. But interestingly enough, inflation never get, get kicked off, so the models would have failed. But we still believed. And part looking around, uh, we were students of history. We looked around and we saw that countries that had that kind of debt levels eventually got into big trouble. You don't know when. And we did use history on the other side of it. We particularly studied very studiously the experience of the United Kingdom and Australia 
been, they addressed their deficits in a very aggressive fashion some 10 years before we did it, and the economy came out okay. I mean, that worked out pretty much the way the textbook said, the so-called fiscal crowding in. You pull the public sector out of the economy, interest rates go down, and private business investment increases. That's what happened in those two cases, and lo and behold, it happened in Canada. But you've got to be a little bit careful applying that lesson to the rest of the countries. We were extremely lucky. We were about the only country in the world that was applying massive fiscal restraint at that time. We had very strong world economic growth, particularly U.S. growth. We had terms of trade gains. A country like Greece has not had, and Italy have not had economic growth for decades, and they're in a context where their trading partners aren't doing well. So again, they would have to look at that history and make some adjustments, whether they're in their models or not. Perry, I wonder if I can get you to uh, maybe extrapolate a bit on this discussion here. There's a former governor of your state who's running for president right now, uh, Mitt Romney. Yes. And I wonder whether or not um, you have any insight into whether the people he's listening to, the economists upon whom presumably he is basing his financial plans for what he'd do with the country if he won, whether you have confidence in them. Um, let me take it even more broadly than that, um, the, so as to be a bit nonpartisan. Um, I think that this whole idea that the job of economists is to be the advisor to policymakers, okay, that is one, uh, that's one part of the job of the economist. Um, what we see here, actually even today in this conversation, why is this conversation happening? Who's the audience of this conversation? We're, we're, we're participants in a larger democratic conversation. I think what your listeners are trying, are looking to us for, are stories, explanations of what happened in the last four years. What was that all about? And did the governments do the right thing? Did they do the wrong thing? Are there things we should be thinking about that we're not thinking about? What should the relationship be between finance and democracy in the, in the modern world? It's these big issues, I think, that, that people are looking to us to have something to say about. Um, and, I, and I think we should have something to say about that. David, in your experience, do politicians listen to economists too much or too little? Uh, I really haven't the faintest idea. I mean, I think <laughs> economists exist to help us to understand the society that we live in. And if people are uninterested in our views, they should ask us. And they're not going to get monolithic views. They're going to get different views from different economists. Politicians face a completely different set of constraints. They've got to get themselves elected before they can do anything. And they proceed with their policies. I think Don is right that Canada was lucky in a way that in the mid-1990s we, we were doing stuff that no one else was really doing. It's a very different situation now when a whole world is in a fiscal mess and everyone is tightening up together. That's a very scary situation. Hmm. Thor, what about it? Do politicians well, Steve, listen uh, to economists too much or too little? Well, well Steve, I, mean, I could jump. Oh, good. So, I mean, my, just, just to spin this a little bit further, I mean, what one has to look at this, this relationship between politicians and economists. It's kind of mm -hmm. a funny relationship in a sense. Funny haha or funny weird? Well, funny weird. <laughs> because uh, if, 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 you, if you're a politician and you want to push an agenda, you will find an economist that tells you why it's good. Of course, there are many mm -hmm. economists that tells you that this is wrong. But it's also like that uh, sometimes it's also a funny relationship or a weird relationship because politicians seem to have lost a little bit being the leaders in a sense, they turn to experts and basically saying the experts telling us this is the right thing to do. You think they just want political cover for it? Is that exactly. why? Exactly. Maybe. And basically they substitute <coughs> uh, exports for leadership. And we see this a little bit in the European crisis again, to give just an example. I think as economists, we understand perfectly well what's going on in the crisis. We have a pretty clear feeling what has to be done to resolve that. But basically now the, pol the politicians have to come together to lead. And it, for the longest time, that hasn't happened. And now, suddenly, something is emerging, what I'm feeling in this, just to bring up an example again. Okay. Don, you wanted to say? Yeah, I want to weigh in the U.S. situation. So you didn't take <coughs> me up on my offer to let me dictator of the world. So can I just be okay. dictator of the United States? And I only need one day. In fact, <laughs> I could be back in Canada by the end, and I would fix their fiscal <laughs> problem. As a technical issue, it's breathtakingly simple. So they spend 17% of the size of their economy on health care. Care, the second tier of most expensive healthcare systems in the world, including Canada's, are in 11 to 12. So they're five percentage points of their GDP plus, more expensive than anybody else, and they don't have particularly good results unless you're extremely wealthy and you need a very complicated procedure. They're very good on that innovative side of it. 
you know, over 40 million people, no health care system, terribly inefficient system. You could take 5% of the GDP out right there. They know how to do it. Their Veterans Administration Hospital and the Kensington Clinics are amongst the most efficient in the world. They're the only developed country in the world that doesn't have a federal value-added sales tax. They have the lowest so-called sin taxes, gasoline, excise taxes, alcohol and tobacco. Hit those four and you're done on the fiscal side. And it won't happen because, quite frankly, their political system is completely ungovernable. <laughs> and you get something like an employment program from the, from the president. It is not a serious proposal. It's just putting a marker down for the election campaign in 2012. Ironically, the biggest uh, political development is the birth of a tax, anti-tax revolution, revolutionary group at a time where they're patently, obviously undertaxed relative to their spending needs. How does that happen? So nothing will happen on that front. Um, but as a, you can't hang that one on the economists. You'd only have to look at it for a few minutes and you'd figure out how to fix that problem. David, you want to react to that? No, I think that's exactly right. And. Uh, uh, yeah, I've got nothing to add to it. Uh, okay. The U.S. The U.S. does not have a fiscal problem from a technical economics point of view. That looked it's that's, easily solvable. That sounded pretty close to Don Drummond endorsing 999, as uh, Herman Cain likes to call it. They need one of those 9 percent national sales taxes, do they? Okay. Well, Perry, what do you think uh, about what Don just had to say? Well, I I think it 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 very much uh, it does connect with what I was just saying before that that economists thinking of themselves too narrowly as just giving expert advice to the prince. Um, I think we have a political economic problem in the United States. I think there's a political economic problem in Europe. Okay, these are the nature of the problems that we're facing right now, and so it's important for economists to to broaden their perspectives and not to and, and, and to and to participate in that conversation we have things to say in which case Perry let's keep the focus on Europe uh, excuse me uh, Thor let me get you to pick up on this should the political leadership in Europe right now which is trying to figure out these trillion dollar bailout packages to prevent the whole eurozone from collapsing should they be listening to economists more I think they are listening to economists uh, now, whether you should listen more is, is, is a big question because, as I said, it's not an economic problem. It's a political problem. Mm -hmm. I think the only way to solve this in the long run is to, to get uh, that the European leaders and the countries get their act together and, and give up sovereignty. Because if you are in a, in a, in a union, in a European union, uh, in a monetary union, you need to make the additional step to go to some type of a fiscal union. And that involves giving up sovereignty. And that's not an economic question. It's, completely a political question and so there must be a willingness to make this extra step. Well they think they've given up a lot of sovereignty already but are you saying they need to go to a almost a European Parliament that has well, supremacy over individual countries? Basically from an economic perspective we have already now a transfer union mm -hmm. with the European uh, financial stability uh, facility we have set up a transfer union what we don't have is really uh, checks and balances in place down the road and uh, we as economists we know we understand that we need that but now in order to basically put the euro area on a solid footing, the politicians have to deliver. They have to ensure fiscal discipline. Now we're going to be back again what, what Don was talking about. Mm -hmm. We kind of know what to do. It involves giving up sovereignty. It, it involves creating enforceable mechanisms that if somebody is misbehaving in a group of people that you can punish that person. Or it's basically in a group of country not different. You have, if some country is misbehaving, you've got to punish that. And we don't have that. And it's a very tough political process to basically get a lot of these countries going this extra step and giving up the sovereignty. Okay. But it's not an economic problem. Perry, you want to follow up on that? The, 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 um, the, you know, the financial and the economic linkages in the Eurozone are, are you know, obviously quite significant right now. The, econo the political ones, less so. If you were an economist advising world leaders in Europe right now, would you be saying to them, we're doing it economically, now politically, you've got to do it as well? Well, yes, I think that's I think that's right. Um, but I I would go beyond what what Tirson was saying about just punishing those who are who are not uh, who are not following the following the rules. If you if you're moving toward a unified Europe, okay, it's it's not so much about um, punishing those who are who are not playing by the rules, but understanding. Why are they not playing by the rules? What, is, what, are, what are the challenges in their particular situation? 
Um, the Greece situation is not, is not so much a debt to GDP ratio problem. It's, it's about who's paying taxes and who's not paying taxes, for example. Now, we can't, we can't seem to speak about that. I think we should be able to speak about that. Um, these are political economic problems, and I think just saying these are things for the political scientists to talk about, and it, it's not my problem as an economist, I think that's, that's selling economics short. Let's keep, it, uh, keep the focus on Europe. David, does it seem yeah. to you as if the problem in Europe right now is more political than economic? Well, it always has been. If you go back to when they were launching the euro, most economists were saying to make a monetary union work, you need a functioning fiscal union. And those who were concerned about accountable government were saying, and if you want a fiscal union, you need some democratic institutions because that old slogan, no taxation without representation is a very, very desirable one. And I'm frankly horrified at what's going on in Europe, whereby government A starts talking about punishing government B for not conforming to rules of the citizens that government B is ruling, we're never consulted about in the first place. I, I think there is a real danger to accountable government emerging in Europe. Uh, I don't know what the alternative, the alternative would be, I don't have any quick answers, but as someone who's concerned with accountable government and accountable economic policy making for political reasons, not for economic reasons, uh, I'm very frightened by the European situation. Hmm. Don, you've just told us that Steve, you think the American yeah, okay. government is dysfunctional. Now David has told us that the European situation is dysfunctional. Where exactly are we supposed to live in this world where we have a functioning economy and political class? Canada. Well, I wanted to pick up on David's point about <laughs> the origins bad, yeah. of the e EU because at some point they decided to throw the economists overboard from the train. Remember those original conditions you were supposed to have a debt to GDP ratio of less than 60% and a deficit of less than 3% of your GDP. Well, excuse me, Greece is at 150% of its GDP and its deficits are running over 10% of its GDP. And a lot of those other fiscal basket cases aren't that much better than them. They shouldn't have been allowed into the EU probably in the first place and they should probably be kicked out at some point if they kept to their economic principles. If Greece was not in that common currency, a fairly automatic economic response would be occurring right now would be a devaluation of their currency. And over time, while that involves some pain, that would address their problems. That, of course, is off the table. I was quite shocked that until July there was almost this insistence because of the semantic gain, they can't be seen to default to their debt, that there can't be any loss taken by their bondholders. And hence, all the adjustment has to be come from some bailout from German taxpayers. And I'm sorry, every time Greece announces they're doing something and they blame it on having to appease the Germans, I, I as a German taxpayer, I'm not going to go on that forever. That, that's not going to work. And they can't just keep pulling back and pulling back on their fiscal because they're calling their economy will implode. So they did force a 21% loss on the bondholders in July, and now they're talking about an increase in a 50%. So I think some greater rationale is occurring. But this is where the politics really take over it. I mean, there's a political commitment and almost a need to show that they can keep this thing together. But, you know, they talk about herding cats. They're just all over the place, and they're not playing by the, the sensible rules that were set out at their origin. Don, I've literally got 20 seconds left here, and I, I can't have you on this program with without asking you in your capacity as the guy tasked by Premier McGinty to figure out how to reform our public services and get our deficit down, how your work is going. Well, I'm just going to say one thing. So in 1984, Greece's debt to GDP ratio was 35%. In 2011, Ontario's 35%. I'll stop there. That is an ominous way upon which to leave this program. But OK, <laughs> you're going to be reporting in February, is that right? That's right. OK. And then you're going to come on this program as soon as you report because we want to find out what you've got to say. Thanks so much, everybody. And hopefully, for... maybe I'll be dictator there. <laughs> okay, Saddam Drummond will be back uh, as soon as he reports back. Uh, Perry Merling from Boston and uh, Don Drummond in Ottawa, David Laidler in London. Thanks so much to the three of you for being there on the line for us. Uh, Thirsten Köppel here uh, in our Toronto studios, also at Queen's University. Thank you so much, Thor, for being on the program as well.